Welcome back. We're ready for our fourth project, and uh, I call this one more solvers. Basically, we're at the end of our ordinary differential equations business. I, uh, I'm not going to introduce any more solvers that we go into in depth. We might end up using some already constructed solvers later in the course that uh, are part of the SciPy package, but I'm promising not to dig in any deep, more deeply than we do this week. So this is the end of ordinary differential equation solvers for now. Um, I want to begin by reminding you of a couple of solvers we've used already. The Euler solver, the Hoyne solver, and then a new type of solver. Actually Euler and Hoyne are, are uh, basically uh, members of a family of solvers uh, called RK solvers or Runge-Kutta solvers. And uh, I want to describe how those guys work. So basically the idea is you advance in space and time. So the degree to which you advance in time is determined by the C coefficients. Here you see the first you evaluate the ribs at S and T. Then you advance the time by C1 times DT. And you advance the space by A21 times F1. F1 is your first uh, extrapolated displacement in uh, space, basically. And what we're doing is taking a piece of that, adding it to our current position, and then reevaluating. And when I talk about position, I mean position in state space. So S is the current vector coordinate in, in state space, is what it boils down to. And then you just repeat that process over and over again to get a bunch of Fs, F1, F2, F3, and so on. And then in the end, you return the old state <coughs> updated by some amount, and the amount is a weighted average of all the different Fs. So you can put all this information in a table called a butcher table, and, uh, and that it basically uh, represents the algorithm, whatever it is. So for example, uh, the Euler algorithm is easy. It's just got one uh, entry in the butcher table, but the Hoyne algorithm has, uh, it's got a, time, a zero measurement of derivatives, and then at the full time step you measure derivatives, and you uh, measure the full time step derivatives at a full space step away, and then you average the uh, F1 and F2 that you compute in this way, and uh, that means the B's are a half and a half. And that's, that's kind of how that works. So uh, there's another example of this called the Runga Kutta fourth order. And that's, I've put the Python for the fourth order Runga Kutta there and the butcher table for that algorithm. So you can see what that looks like. So we'll be using this. This is a fourth order uh, algorithm, very much like the Hoyne step, except now if you reduce the time difference dt by a factor of 2, you get a uh, factor of 4 improvement in accuracy. Stop, 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 stop. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. If you reduce the time step by a factor of 2, you get a factor of 16 improvement in accuracy. Accuracy. So it's a little more aggressive in terms of improving accuracy than the second order method we've been using. But uh, but it still has issues. So let's, let's move on and talk about the symplectic methods. And to do that, I want to describe <clears throat> a certain class of problem we're going to encounter called Hamiltonian problems. They're basically problems where uh, there are no, so there are all internal forces that are acting on a system and no outside forces do work so that the system changes its energy is what it boils down to. So all the uh, internal forces give rise to a potential energy and of course when there's motion there's kinetic energy and so you can write down the Hamiltonian as the sum of the kinetic and potential energies <clears throat> and as long as the Hamiltonian doesn't explicitly depend on time, which it wouldn't in this case, then um, the energy turns out to be conserved. That's the idea. So uh, now these two equations here, uh, dq dt is the partial of h with respect to p, and dp dt is minus the partial of h with respect to q, are called Hamilton's equations. 
the Q represent uh, all the coordinate, all the uh, generalized coordinates of the system, and the P's represent the generalized uh, conjugate momenta. So if we have a single particle moving in one dimension, Q would just be the x-coordinate of the particle, and P would be the momentum of the particle. You can see that uh, if you are dealing with low speeds, so that uh, the velocity is much less than the speed of light, that uh, the kinetic energy is just going to be p squared over 2m, and dh dp is nothing other than uh, p divided by m, which is v. That's the rate of change of q. So that works out. And then um, dp dt here is minus the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to position. Well, the only position dependence of the Hamiltonian is in the potential energy, and minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to position is going to be nothing other than the force in the direction in that component of uh, space. And so what we have here is dp dt is equal to the net force. And so that also makes sense. That's just the momentum principle. So let's take a concrete example. The simple harmonic oscillator is a mass on a spring. <clears throat> and the kinetic energy is p squared over 2m. The potential energy is 1 half kq squared, where k is the spring constant. And we get dp dt is minus k times q, that's Hooke's law. And then dq dt is p over m, which is nothing other than the velocity. So that just says that the rate of change of q is the velocity, the rate of change of p is the net force. I want to notice one other thing. <clears throat> In this kind of problem, where you have a clear separation between kinetic energy and potential energy, the rate of change of the momentum depends only on the position. The rate of change of the position depends only on the momentum. And so that produces a kind of structure that sort of more or less defines the symplectic uh, system. It means that um, as systems like this evolve in phase space, phase space is a space that has momentum and position as the uh, coordinates of a particle. It's the, uh, how can you say it, the generalized coordinates of a particle as it moves, as it evolves in time. If you know its position and its momentum, you know everything you, you need to know to figure out what it's going to do next. And so you can use a phase space plot Momentum is the vertical axis, position is the horizontal axis, to track the evolution of a system. Um, and uh, systems that have this behavior are, are uh, called symplectic. In other words, they, um, what we're going to find is that systems like this conserve the area that an ensemble of particles uh, surround in phase space. Let's see how that works. So let's take a moment to look at phase space. <clears throat> it's a, for a one-dimensional system, it looks like an x-y coordinate system, except the y is really momentum and the x is really their general, generalized coordinate position. Uh, if we're talking about a simple harmonic oscillator, we start out at p equals zero and q is positive. You can see from the Hamilton's equations that that means the rate of change of p is going to be negative. Um, that makes sense because if the spring is stretched, if, the, if q measures the amount of stretch of the spring, then the string being stretched is going to pull the particle uh, in the negative coordinate direction, and that's going to give it negative momentum. So the thing is going to evolve downward like that. And uh, as it evolves downward, of course, p becomes negative. As p becomes negative, q gets smaller, because dq dt is p over m, so a negative p means q is changing in the negative direction. And eventually, q will become zero, and then q will become negative. When q becomes negative, um, then dp dt is going to become positive, and the thing's going to start getting positive momentum. If you wait around for a while, the thing will uh, orbit the origin of phase space, um, and it will repeat itself over and over again. If I start with an ensemble of particles like this, they, their trajectories will also follow along in a similar way, something like that. And the interesting thing is the nature of these equations and the fact that the Hamiltonian, the rate of change of momentum depends only on position and the rate of change of position depends only on momentum, you can show that it means that the area enclosed by an ensemble of systems in phase space uh, is constant. That is, as the thing goes around, it encloses a fixed amount of area. That is 
the technical reason. It's called symplectic. It's the structure that gives it that property. And what we're going to see in a moment is that uh, it's possible to construct an, an algorithm for integrating these differential equations that also preserves this area. And that has other beneficial side effects, which we'll talk about. But let's, let's take a look at a demo here, and I'll give you a better sense of how that works. Okay, so here we are looking at the handout, the notebook for this time, the higher order methods. Um, here's a little blurb about the butcher table, and here's the butcher table for the Runge-Kutta fourth order method. And here is the Runge-Kutta fourth order method. Um, and then there's also a little bit about these symplectic methods. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that in more detail. First of all, here's our old friend, the Euler step. This is the plain old Euler step where we take the derivative's result is a vector in phase space, right? It points, it has a certain rate of change in position and a certain rate of change in momentum. And it advances our point, our coordinate in phase space in both directions at the same time. Now, it turns out that if you do that, where you advance both uh, position and momentum at, at the same time, you end up not conserving the area bounded by a, an ensemble of systems. So that is not symplectic. I can make it symplectic by uh, first advancing only in space and then taking the new position that I get when I advance in space only, reevaluate derivatives, <clears throat> and use that to advance only in, in momentum. So we advance in space and then we advance in momentum. Remember Space and momentum are the two sort of <coughs> subspaces of the phase space. And then, uh, so that's called the symplectic Euler step. It's symplectic because it conserves area and phase space, which we'll see in a moment. It's first order because, it, uh, well, you can check to see that it's first order by seeing how the error depends on the step size. It turns out to be proportional to the step size. Um, but uh, even though there are two parts to it, it's not a second-order method. Now, the verlet breaks the time step in half. It does a space step, a momentum step, and then a space step again. It turns out to be second-order. Um, because of the breaking of the time step in half and evaluating uh, derivatives actually three times in this case. And there are other ways to implement verlet where you, where you uh, do a full step in space and then a full step in momentum and a full step in space and a full step in momentum, but that requires uh, that you build the stepping right into the uh, loop. And so I didn't want to do that. I wanted to keep the step function separate from the loop so that I it would be very generic that way. So anyway, uh, different ways to do it, but this, this is a second order symplectic method called the Verlet method. And uh, here we have some code. This is an example of using the Euler step and the symplectic Euler step in a simple harmonic oscillator. So I want to point out some of the differences between this and the point step, which we've already done. First of all, I want to pick a simple harmonic oscillator with a spring constant of 1 and a mass of 1. And then we've got a derivatives function, <coughs> which is a lot like the derivatives function we had before, except now, in addition to the coordinate in state space and the current time, we're going to pass in a step parameter, and uh, step can be none. If it's none, it means you're not using the symplectic approach. You're not advancing time and uh, space and momentum separately. You're advancing them together. So that would be like a runga kutta or a hoin or an Euler. Um, in that case, step will just be none. But if you pass in a number here for step, either 0 or 1, it will choose to do a space step or a momentum step depending on the value that you pass in. So let's see how that works. First of all, I want to be able to have a, as big a state as I like with as many particles as I like, but the convention that I'm using is that the positions all come and then the momenta all come. So um, basically, actually, it's the positions and then the velocities. So uh, if we have three particles, it would be x1, x2, and x3, the three x-coordinates of the three particles, and then v1, v2, and v3 um, for the three, what you call, uh, velocities of the three particles. So I first take the length of s, that's going to be twice as many, the number, which is the length of s, will be 
two times the number of particles. I divide it by two and that gives me the number of particles. Then the velocity is the part of the state starting at n up to the end of the state. So if I have six particles it would be from three up to the end. And the position of course is zero up to the number of particles, zero to three in, in the case of three particles. So if step equals zero that means we're doing a uh, symplectic integration, but all we care about is the rate of change of the position. Step zero means we're doing a Q step. We're changing only the position. So I just return the velocity in the first n slots and zero for the second set of n slots. Append is a utility that takes two arrays and combines them into a single array. So if we're doing a, a Q step, step will come in as zero and I'll just return velocity and zero. So we're putting in no rate of change in momentum, so the momentum will not change. On the other hand, if step is not zero, it means one of two things. It either means we're doing a Runge-Kutta algorithm, or it means we're doing a symplectic algorithm where we want to take a velocity step or a momentum step, where we want to change the momentum. In that case, I'm going to need the position, I'm going to need to calculate the acceleration, if step is none, that means I'm doing a Runge-Kutta, so that means I want to return uh, the rate of change of position and the rate of change of velocity as the rate of change of the state. On the other hand, if it's not none, it must be one, because it's either zero, one, or none. Those are the only options, so I, I won't even check to see what it is. I'll just assume it's one, and then we'll put in zeros as the rate of change of position, and then the acceleration I've calculated as the rate of change of velocity. So this one derives function works for, sorry, I've bumped it around here. It works for all, both of these approaches, either the Euler step or the symplectic Euler step or the Verlet step or any of the other steps we want to do. So let's see how this turns out. I just want to show you, you can look at this, just download this thing online and see what it looks like. But uh, basically I, w I wanted the plot to be a little bigger, so I dug into the, uh, code to figure out what parameter I need to change to make the figures bigger. It turns out to be <clears throat> it's this thing called um, fig figure fig size, and uh, <clears throat> then I have a variable that I set to be true or false. If I want to do a symplectic algorithm, I set this to true. If I want to do the Euler algorithm, I set it to false. And then um, delta is how far apart are the ensemble points. So what I'm going to do is create a particle, it's S0, it's at x equals 1 and v equals 0, and then I'm going to create another particle that's delta to the right of that in, in phase space, another particle that's delta to the right and delta above, and another particle that's delta above, uh, but at the same place. So remember the first slot is position, the second slot is momentum. So that means I'm going to start this guy out with a little bit of extra momentum, start this guy out with extra momentum, these two guys, I'll start delta to the right and delta to the right, and at the same x-coordinate. And then uh, this is a little, little beautiful, uh, interesting thing. And basically, I make an array out of my state, initial state vectors. I transpose it, I flatten it, convert it to a list, and convert that to an array. So basically, it's an easy way to convert these uh, two-element state vectors into a combined state vector that has one, two, three, four, five sets of coordinates, position and momentum. <clears throat> so if you print out S at the beginning, you could add a print S to the beginning here, you'll see that it's, uh, it's, well actually why don't we do it. I'll go ahead and add print S here and then when we run this we'll look, uh, we'll look on the output and see what S is at the beginning. And I'll see S0, we'll call it S at, at t equals zero. Put it that way. Okay, and then of course do symplectic means I'm doing a symplectic, so I change the title, I change the size of the graph. If it's not do symplectic, that means it's Euler, and so I change the title and change the size of the graph. And this is just a bunch of stuff to format the graph. You can look at that. But basically, if it's do symplectic, I'm calling the symplectic Euler step. If it's not, I call just the plain old Euler step, and then I'm plotting these guys as I go. So 
So we're gonna, this is what the graph looks like for the Euler step. Notice that the area bounded by this family of uh, part, trajectories in phase space keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's what I mean by the area is not conserved. And notice also the energy is not conserved, because in the simple harmonic oscillator, the energy, of course, is one half uh, x squared plus p squared. It's the energy of a k equals one, m equals one simple harmonic oscillator. It's just the distance from the origin. The distance from the origin just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But if I go back and change the do symplectic to true, and then I run the thing, Actually, I need to uh, run everything. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and run all the cells up to this one. So I'll run this one, this one, this one, this one. There we go. That's what the symplectic looks like. And notice this is what the s at t equals zero is. I've got x, x1, x2, x3, x4, v, uh, x5. V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. So I got five velocities, five positions. <clears throat> and uh, that corresponds to one, one, two, three, four, five. I only put five in. There's two at the same place, but I only put five in to, to uh, close the, where'd it go here? To close the square so it looks like a complete square. Notice as this one goes, what happens to the area? The, the shape of the uh, ensemble, the relationship of the pieces to one another changes. But as the thing goes around, the area is conserved, and when it and then it comes back to the area it had before. So that's a that's the characteristic of a symplectic algorithm. Notice that it has the side effect. While the energy is not conserved, we have a little too much energy here because it's going away from the origin. We have a little too little energy here because it's getting close to the origin. But on the average, the energy. Um, stays bounded, it doesn't keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger like it does with the Euler algorithm. So that's good. Um, here's the Verlet step. This is the second order method. Here's the runge kutta algorithm, the fourth order non-symplectic algorithm. I've got another uh, version. I'm going to, again, use the simple harmonic oscillator. But this time, I'm just going to start with the, uh, let's see, I can find S here. Oh, SR and SV. So if you look up SR, uh, I'm starting at X at 1 and V at 0. I start SR and SV as state arrays using the runge kutta and the Verlet algorithm. And then we're just going to calculate the energy. Here is the energy for the runge kutta. Here is the energy for the Verlet. And we just make lists of those and plot them. So what happens is, here is the Verlet energy. It's uh, got a tremendous amount of variation. It goes from 0.5 to 0.51, basically. But notice it stays bounded. It never goes outside of this bound. The Runge Kutta is much more accurate. In other words, the range of energies that it has as it goes around is much smaller. But notice that it drifts, and it drifts pretty badly away from the uh, correct value. The energy should be constant at about a half. So uh, the Runge Kutta just keeps drifting and drifting and drifting. So that's the main thing I wanted to point out. Um, the goal for this project is to compute the orbit of an asteroid. So I gave you a couple examples here. Here's an example where we compute the motion of the Earth. And you can see we're using Runge Kutta in this case. And the Earth goes around once in a year. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. I did want to point out that I'm using units where time is measured in years, distances are measured in astronomical units, and it turns out the gravitational constant times the mass of the sun in those units is exactly 4 pi squared, or 2 pi quantity squared, or 4 pi squared. Um, you can convince yourself of that if you assume the Earth orbits at one astronomical unit and has a period of a year. This has to be true. Um, and uh, so when I calculate the acceleration, it's g times the mass of the sun times the mass of the earth times r hat over r squared times the mass of the earth. The mass of the earth cancels. The uh, r hat over r squared is nothing other than r divided by r cubed. So uh, you can convince yourself that that's the correct formula for the acceleration. Notice r is a vector. So uh, this is a vector calculation. A must also therefore be a vector. And uh, 
So that's the idea. And this is this is also uh, a derivative function with a step. And so we're only calculating the acceleration in the cases where we need to. If we're in a step equals zero case, we only need the velocity. We don't need the acceleration. Otherwise, we need the acceleration. And so if it's if step is none, we return both. If step is one, in this case, we put zeros in for the rate of change of x and only return the rate of change of v. Anyway, it produces a nice graph that shows the Earth's orbit. And finally, I put in some starter code for the asteroid program. We've got the mass of the Sun, we've got the mass of Jupiter, we've got a typical mass of an asteroid. Um, this one, this derives is just for Runge-Kutta type. You're going to need to modify it the way the other two are modified in order to uh, make it work with a symplectic algorithm. So you're going to have to check the value of step, which is not in here right now, and um, and make the thing work in that case. Uh, anyway, if you run it, you get a picture that shows the orbit of the asteroid and the orbit of Jupiter. And that's the way it goes. Okay, so the actual project that I want you guys to do is to study the orbit of asteroids between Mars and Jupiter. There's this thing called the asteroid belt. I want you to investigate the orbital properties of an asteroid. Okay, and um, the first thing you have to do is to figure out what's the orbital radius of an object whose orbital period is half Jupiter's. So we need to remind ourselves how planets go, figure out how far from the Sun an object would have to be so that its period is half of Jupiter's period. That uh, point, that orbit, is a two to one resonance. That means that the planet or the object at that radius is going to go around twice every time Jupiter goes around once. The consequence of that, if it happened to have that orbital radius, is that every other time it goes around, it's going to feel a perturbation from Jupiter's to the attractive gravity of Jupiter. And that's going to have an effect on its orbit. So we'll see. Uh, if you look up the Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt, you'll see that there are definite orbital radii at which basically no asteroids orbit. And the reason is Jupiter gets in there and pulls them out of that orbit if they happen to have this uh, coincidental period relationship. So, and that's what I want you guys to study. I'd like you to study it both with the Runge-Kutta algorithm and with the symplectic algorithm. See if you can see any difference in the energy behavior or the spatial orbital behavior uh, using those two algorithms. And I think that's all we have for this time. We'll see you guys next time.